as I brought up our beloved brother Shegun Areo of the Potter's House Christian Ministry. God bless you, sir. You are welcome, sir. Praise the Lord. I will tell you that it's a privilege to serve the Lord. It's a privilege to, to be here and to share fellowship with you and to break the bread of life also with you. I think God just arranged it that I should be here this morning because I mistakenly forgot to put a meeting that should be in this morning on my itinerary. As I checked, it was just blank. I just said, oh, if it's the morning, I will come. Because I was driving from Lagos yesterday that the brother said, I hope you didn't forget you'll be with us this morning. I said, no, I didn't know. I know of uh, Dr. Lua Shola. I don't know about you. I must have forgotten. And actually, we've been talking about that since three months ago. And I didn't remember to put it there. I think God just created that space just for me to be here this morning. Praise the Lord. I believe the Lord is going to um, help us as we look intently at his word this morning, uh, whereas it is to address the youth, but I also believe that all of us are young people uh, in God's hand, and um, we still have, as long as we live, we are yet young, and uh, we are younger than tomorrow, I think so. And so God is still able to do something through our lives. Let's bow our heads as we pray together. Eternal Father, I want to thank you and um, appreciate you for this um, great mercy which you have brought to us in a time like this and especially um, giving us opportunity to set a moment apart to look into and to look towards the young people that you have brought uh, under our hands. Thank you because they represent our tomorrow. And we believe that our tomorrow will be better if we are able to provide the ministry that you have committed into our hands to guide them into what they ought to do. Even Jesus, as great as he is, couldn't just fathom that his time to enter into ministry had come. It took his mother to press him at Khan of Galilee to perform that miracle which was the beginning of his miracles. Uh, Lord, it was recorded there so that we will know that at every point we will need the elders to guide the young ones in the way they should go under God so that they will not miss it at any point. Lord, to this end we have come humbly uh, to uh, a simple instrument in your hand to uh, speak to these young lives and into them and that you might walk in them, through them, so that we could rest by the time we are quitting the stage and they come to take over, that the future is well secured. We trust that it's not just the future, their own lives too will be well secured in the hollow of your hand. Lord, we trust that um, these are much more you will do for us. For we have prayed with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I will be speaking on youth with a difference. And um, I'm giving a passage which um, I am going to uh, deal with. Daniel chapter 1. I'm going to read from verses 17 to 20 and if you don't mind I could read on to verse 21 which is the end of that chapter Daniel chapter number 1 
I'll read from verses 17 to 21. I'll be reading the Old King James Version. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king communed with them. And among them all was found none like Daniel, Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. And Daniel continued, even unto the first year of King Cyrus. May the Lord bless and grant increase unto this word in our hearts in the name of Jesus. I I am looking at so many issues in this passage of the Bible which I would like to um, discuss. I wish I could bring them forth in bullet points just to ease the journey. But yet, I would desire that the Lord should just uh, speak to us the way he wants, um, especially because of what is at stake. I am aware, or I could just assume, that Daniel was not um, a strange person to any of us. If I ask you, in fact, it was surprising that um, when I was in the Bible school, Daniel was classified among the major prophets. So we studied major prophet, minor prophet. It became a little bit controversial because we felt, so how did you rate them? That you call some minor, another one major. And I remember my principal said, all right, let's use a pre-exilic prophet and post-exilic prophet. That would be a little bit comfortable. And so we settled for that. But years after I left the school, and interestingly, the school was just opposite barracks there, Live International College of Theology. That was in the 80s. Years after I left the school, I was just wondering in my heart, how did Daniel become a prophet and who ordained him as a prophet? I sat through the scriptures I couldn't find anywhere. He was ordained as a prophet. So how did we now come to agree that he was a prophet? Of course, it was very obvious from everywhere you could turn to in the Bible that Daniel was a prophet of the Almighty God. But there was no ordination service. There was... There was nowhere he referred to himself as a prophet. But we concluded that this man was a prophet. And up to now, he's still prophesying. If Daniel continued to the day of King Cyrus, I almost could tell you that even till today, Daniel continued. And those are the issues that I feel show push us to find out what was in Daniel that was not in others 
that made him to stand out in the crowd. What made the difference in Daniel's life and in his ministry? So much so that the ordination was left in our hand. The title was left in our hand. The labor was left in our hand to attach to him whoever he could mean to us. Of course, studying him, I have come to learn so many things. And I know that in my younger years as a Christian, Daniel was one of those that I studied so much, in, and Joseph. And I remember I made some very serious covenants, promises unto God, even though I was not sure of what I was talking about. But seeing this life, I just felt I needed to tie my life with certain promises before God as I grow in the faith. Now, for you to appreciate some of the things that I will have to say, I will need to read verse 1 of chapter 1 so that um, you will understand it. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with parts of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. Now, if you hear that, I also need to read chapter 2, verse 1, so that I can combine it together. And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. Now, even though my... My desire is not to go into historical settings around what I want to discuss with you. But I don't know how I will deal with it without bringing this up first. Chapter 1 of the book of Daniel, the way the Hebrews write um, normally is that they will start with summary. And then after the summary they will start with the details. That's what you find also in Genesis chapter 1. Um, and Jabesh was more honorable than all his brothers. And then the details followed. You find that pattern in the Bible. So I was taught when I was in the Bible school. Now, I realized that when the Bible mentioned the year of Jehoiakim, when Nebuchadnezzar invaded Israel, and chapter 2, verse 1, tells me that the popular dream of Nebuchadnezzar that threw up Daniel came to Nebuchadnezzar in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, which means Nebuchadnezzar invaded Israel during the first year that he sat upon the throne. I don't know whether you understand that. And it was after that invasion that Daniel secured scholarship to go and study in the University of Babylon. And if the dream that Daniel interpreted came to Nebuchadnezzar in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar, it means that Daniel was in 100 level when that dream came. I don't know whether that makes sense to you. Does it make sense? It does. All right. So, if it comes with a sense, we need to try and visualize the age of Daniel, the situations of Daniel, his, his life, his exploits, 
and the way he handled his exploits. Those are the few things I would like to discuss. And for me, those are the things that made difference in Daniel's life. Now, first is the fact that Daniel lost his father and his mother, lost his family, lost his homeland, and was brought to Babylon to live in the midst of people of strange language, strange culture, strange beliefs, strange creed, strange tradition. It was like that. And from the look of things, he must be a teenager. And I felt in my heart the exploits of Daniel, which I may not talk so much about this morning, wouldn't have been possible if he had not met with the God of his fathers before the invasion came. Now I want you to listen carefully. I feel like saying to all of you who are young people here that it will be to your advantage. I have prayed this prayer. We have prayed it, and my wife, and I'm still praying it. The tendency for me as a preacher is very high to lose my children in making them to think so much about the God of their father without them knowing God as their own God. Because I go around preaching about this God and I, I develop that fear that one day they will just think about our daddy has this God that he's talking about. We don't know about him. So for years I have been calling upon the Lord that they will come to personally meet God, personally relate with God, and they will not see God as the God of their parents, but they will see God as their own God. So I felt in my heart that even though there were preachers in Israel, who talk so much about the God of Abraham, about the God of Isaac, about the God of Jacob. I think Daniel came to know God as his own personal God. So when the invasion came and he lost contact with the Torah, and he lost contact with the synagogue and the preachers that, that, that permeated the entire landscape of Israel, there was a God that lived inside of Daniel, with Daniel brought to Egypt and brought into the university. I don't know whether I'm communicating at all. My prayer is that God is going to make you great in life. And you will be great. Jesus talked about two people in Matthew 7. The wise builder and the foolish builder. I added one to it. As I read that story, I said, ah, Oh Lord, it appeared there are more than one, two. There is also the half wise and half foolish builder, which I'm also seeing here. Jesus Christ said, The wise one is the one who heareth my word and doeth them. I will liken him to a wise man who builds his house on the rock when the rain comes when the wind blow and when flood came the hand the house stood strong but the foolish one will hear my word and will not do it he is a person who builds his house upon the sand uh, i looked at that story one day and i remember that when peter was talking to the leaders in chapter 4 of the book of Acts, suddenly he looked at them straight in the eyes and said, this is a stone that ye builders have set at naught. So it occurred to me that a wise man 
is the man who builds on the rock and builds with stone. He builds on Christ and he builds with Christ. The foolish man built on sand and I tried to check what could be sand. Oh, I realized that men were made from the dust of the ground. When a man builds his life on the principle of men, philosophy of men, that's a foolish person. And he also built with sand. But the half wise and the half foolish is such a man who has found Christ as the rock, as the foundation, and yet he built with sand. Or he, he laid his foundation in the sand and then he builds with stone. And that's the trouble I find with many people now. You find somebody who has very good knowledge of the Bible. He speaks the language of the Bible. He sings the song of Christian but has no foundation. He is building with stone and yet he has laid his foundation on the sand. So I ask you, have you known Christ personally? Have you come to the saving knowledge of Christ as a person? The danger of having a very correct pastor is very high in you just assuming that since your pastor is a correct pastor, I'm also correct. Joseph and Mary, they thought that Jesus was with the acquaintances. And I'm also thinking that each time they look to us where their friends and acquaintances were, and those ones smile back, and they also smile back, they are thinking Jesus was with them. And those ones are also thinking that Jesus was with his spirit. The two of them were fooling one another. Until they stopped to check. It was when they checked, they realized that they have lost Jesus. Could you be traveling based on mere assumption that Christ is in your life when he's not there? Could you have based your assumption just because you have opportunity to lead prayers or draw the word of God or sometimes allow to touch certain things in the church? That could make you to think that you have it. I tell you, it's very dangerous. You will be like the half-wise and half-foolish person who has laid his foundation on the sand, yet building with stone. That house will also collapse. There is a need to stop and check. There is a need to find out if actually you have met with Christ. And how will you know? I read in Matthew 1.27, that he shall give back to his son and he shall call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. So the first thing I know, you will know and notice in your life. Is that you will have been delivered from your sins. It's a different kettle of fish for a man to obtain forgiveness of sin. That is very readily available. But it's another thing entirely to have deliverance from sin. So have you been delivered from your own sin? Which you know very well. If you are not, maybe you have not met Christ. Because those who belong to him, he delivers them from their sins. So it's the first issue, is the first thing that made difference in the life of Daniel. Early enough, not knowing what shall befall him. Not knowing he will be denied access to the Torah, which they taught them in the synagogues. Not knowing he will not have opportunity for fellowship for many years. Not knowing that he will be the only fellowship member, the president, the secretary, the organizing secretary, that will be praying inside his house. He didn't know that when he set out very early to develop a personal relationship with the God of his father until that God became his God. Daniel was not joking about it. As I study his story, 
I came to where Gabriel came to him. And Gabriel said, thou beloved of God. I, 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 I touched something that sounds like jealousy. Not negative jealousy, actually. For an angel to call a mortal man beloved of God. I think they must have discussed it among themselves so much. What is it about this Daniel that God always talk about him here? I feel I should challenge you first that if you are going to stand tall and stand long and defy or defy every storm of life tomorrow, this foundation must be well laid. And there is no other foundation that any man can lay other than that which is laid. 1 Corinthians 3.11 and that foundation is Christ. It is foolishness for a man to build without stones. This building cannot stand here without stones. Can it, sir? It cannot. It cannot. It is unwise to build your life on human philosophies, on human skills, on human experiences, and not on Christ. And it is outrightly wrong for you to also build with another material other than Christ. So the first thing is, have you come into that personal relationship with Jesus? Is the first thing. And this is not just for the young ones. Even for those of us who are elders, you need to stop and check. You need to have a checklist and be sure that you have come to know Jesus. Our fathers in Yoruba land we say, Terebakwe But I tell them that when you have enough water and you rinse it properly, leave will come out and soap will stand aloof. You could have been around church issues for many years. That naturally you belt, you belt church, you breathe church, you talk church, and you are so churched that you have lost sight of the Christ who is the center of the church. And churchinity is not the same thing as Christianity. You could be a churchin and you are not a Christian. I, I feel that's a foundation on which everything stands. That's the first thing that I noticed about Daniel. Now, when Daniel came to Babylon and he was there I saw that he made up his mind never to be absorbed into the system of Babylon. So when Nebuchadnezzar was looking for those that he needed in the palace, I realized that in verse 3, the Bible says, And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel. You see, it's the word certain that appealed to my mind. Certain could mean definite. Certain sometimes could mean precise. I was wondering why the insertion of the word certain and why not just children of Israel. It looks to me as if at that point in time, it is not every child of Israel that looks certain. Some had compromised their tradition. Some have compromised their fashion. Some have compromised their taste. 
that you are no longer sure whether they were Israelites or Babylonians. But the specific instruction Nebuchadnezzar gave to Ashpenaz, look around and find for me children of Israel with certainty. Children of Israel without compromise. That once you see them like this, you know that this one took his descent from Abraham. Now I ask you, how many years have you spent in university that you lost your certainty as a Christian? And how many months salary entered into your account that we are no longer sure where you belong now? It's, it's, it's so disturbing that you meet somebody who is a child of your father and you are not sure anymore. The certainty is no longer there. I read about the woman with the issue of blood. In fact, the way the Bible described her, the Bible used the word certain woman. Now, looking at her merely from a distance, she looked every inch a woman with certainty. Until the Bible began to talk about the uncertainty about her womanhood. That this one is dripping blood continuously for 12 years. But you will not notice because she had a um, solution in the use of sanitary towel. Blood implies life. This man was losing life continuously for 12 years. But you will not know because she had a covering for it. Even though by the feminine futures, she looked certain as a woman. But when you dig deep down, you'll find very many uncertainties about her life. They have taken advantage of her many times. She has spent her living looking for solution. Life was no longer certain for her. Now, the question I'm asking you now is, is there any certainty about your being a child of God? Will God beat his chest when you sit in an exam hall that you are actually a certain child of his and there is no doubt about it? When you are at a very loose moment with the opposite sex, will your certainty come out? Will it be so certain that you will not misbehave? These are questions begging for answer. I noticed that only four could be selected as certain. Daniel and three others. And huge number of them came to Babylon. But as soon as they came to Babylon, they fused into Babylon. They changed the way they dress. They changed their fashion. They changed their taste. They changed their literature. They started reading literature of the Babylonians. They went on the social media of the Babylonians and they imbibed everything they could see there. Hook, line, and sinker. And they lost their certainty. Now, I was so shocked that even Nebuchadnezzar was not looking for the compromised ones. He was not looking for those who could not defend their nationality, though they are in the minority. He was not interested in those who are not, who are not, I don't like to use the word proud, because as Christians, we shouldn't be proud. But maybe for ease of communication, who are proud of who they are. Uh, but I would love to use the word satisfied. They don't satisfy being, being Israelites. They told Mordecai, won't you bow to Haman? That was the order of the king. Mordecai said, I cannot bow. They said, what do you have? Is it money or position or influence? Why won't you bow? Eh? You are risking your life. He said, I can't bow. He said, I have my reason. Said, What's your reason? When they pestered him, I was shocked when he said, because I'm a Jew. I said, being a Jew, what is the meaning of that? He said, I'm a Jew. 
That's the reason I cannot bow. I said, I, what's the meaning of that? But as I checked the scriptures, I realized what it meant to be a Jew. It was in the record that God told Moses to write and rehearse in the ears of Joshua that the memorial of the Amalekite will be wiped off. So as far as Mordecai was concerned, Haman was a dead man. He doesn't have money. He doesn't have position. He doesn't have power. He doesn't have influence. He had the word of God. He knew what the word God gave to them spoke to his heart about the Amalekites. And as far as he was concerned, since this one is even an Agagite, he's supposed not to leave. How will I bow down to a dead man? God forbid. He was willing to to risk everything, including his life, in the defense of the word, the oracle that God has given to him. Now, I want to say to you, friends, that one of the things that will make you to stand out, I wish I could say certain things in Yoruba language. I don't know whether you permit me. You permit me. I'm a local boy. Don't let my look deceive you. I'm a very, very local boy. Yoruba boy with NAVDAC number. Okay. <laughs> Yoruba ni Aifele Kibosi ni Ojare ni Jo. If you see a man, now there are, permit me, there are here do that I see around today that you only find with mad people in those days. Am I correct? Now, because some people were bold enough to do it, and they do it with boldness, people picked it from them, and they do it. So, something tells me that if you are bold about your conviction, about who you are, number one, they will appreciate you for who you are, and they will come to tabernacle with you. Am I making sense at all? All right. So, the number two thing I noticed about Daniel was that the certainty of his being a child of Israel was without question. He was not an ambiguous Christian. His Christianity was clear. His position over issues was very clear. They knew what they could predict him. The fact that he was in university didn't enter into his head. He knew that first and foremost, I am an Israelite before I'm a student. And I will not allow being a student in the best university to make me to lose the certainty of my identity. I feel in my heart that this also made Daniel a different species. Why do you drop your faith in the face of a Muslim? And you know a Muslim will always be bold about who he is. He tells you I am a Muslim and he will tell you that Quran is against this and he stands by it. If you, if you mess up with him, is people will gather around him to support him. And I wonder why is it that we cannot stand like that? Why is it that you cannot profess who you are in such a way that people will predict you that you can't do this? Don't go to him. Don't invite him to this. He won't just do We know him. We know he will not compromise his faith. He is too much in love with his God that he will never do anything against that God. Friends, I want to say to you that if you are going to be a youth with a difference, then the certainty about your descent, about your gene, must be firm, must be such that he is open to all. I remember a prophet called Micaiah. 400 men were prophesying in the palace of Ahab. And Jehoshaphat was there. He listened to 400 prophets prophesying. And at the end of their prophecy, 
He didn't say amen. His response was, is there not yet a prophet of the Lord from whom we may inquire? And the response of Ahab was, there is yet one man. I have begged God over the years that when they say there are no more preachers anywhere, let it be said there is yet one brother. There is yet one who never compromised his stance. There is yet one man that will never tell you lies. There is yet one student that will never cheat, no matter how open opportunities could be. There is yet one person that will not compromise his faith, no matter the danger inherent in such stand that made a lot of difference in the life of Daniel now I will mention one more thing and then I will now talk about the the the, the relationship the influence and the exploit of Daniel within the little time I have left and then we can come to see his continuity. I noticed that when they were given scholarship and it was full scholarship, Daniel did not reject it. He passed jam and post jam very excellently and he was given that scholarship. Part of the scholarship was that they eat the same food that the king eats. That would be an opportunity for a slave who had been drinking gari for years now or for months. That would have come to Daniel as a result of a reward of his skill, a reward of his performance. This is an opportunity. I must grab it with my two hands. But I was surprised that as soon as they enter into the university, Daniel called his friends and said, I just want you to know. I'm not interested in you joining me, but I feel I should tell you my decision. I have decided to live as a student on this campus and not as a king. I am not a king yet. I am a student. And I want that to register in my mind. I cannot be living big when I'm still struggling to learn. I cannot be eating what my lecturers could not eat. I cannot be living above my lecturers. That will not help me in my academics. I will eat only pulse and some call it beans Abby? and that's the food of students now I, when I was in school and I'm going to cook beans like this I will eat it I will cook the whole pot will be full I will take it like that first take it with gari anointed with gari then I'll take the next one I will just make it a concrete, you know. <laughs> All these times in which you will eat beans, I will eat it. Because that's a food that is so easy to afford and you can eat for a long time. Now, can I say this to you? If you are going to be great tomorrow, Will you please ask God to help you to live a simple life now? Can you just can you just beg him to help your heart not to desire great things now for yourself even though you are going to be great tomorrow? You don't have to eat tomorrow today. There's no reason for it. This Daniel decided to eat 
like a poor boy that he was, even though all his colleagues were living like kings on campus. And I thought within me that God saw that in Daniel and God marked him for greatness. God saw that attitude in Daniel, a man who is just simple, a man who is not complex, a man who will be given opportunities but will not use it for himself or hijack it for selfish purpose. That was the kind of life Daniel led while on campus. He was feeding on beans. Of course, the, the chief cook was afraid because he knew that the king offered that to them so that they could look great. When they went for interview, these children were looking haggard and gaunt, as it were. And they, they needed to, to flesh them up, sort of. They needed to boost them and look like big guys on campus. But Daniel said, that does not come by eating. It comes by favor. And actually, just like Dr. Olu Washola said, when we say, ah, M and Toby, I said, is the word, the word is made flesh. I have come to know that it is not food that makes a man grow big. Honestly, I don't have time to eat most times. And yet, I'm not growing lean. I think the world is becoming flesh every day. <laughs> I want you to understand that there is, there is a great reward for a man who has grip on his appetite either for food or for sleep or for fashion. That you may wonder, how does that affect me? I wish I could sit down on that and talk about it. I wish I could discuss very freely with you about it. But I can tell you here that did you understand that? You know Alubasa now. If you open another one, you see another cloth inside. You open another one, you see another At the end of it, you will not see anything inside. No substance inside. I'm not against you buying the latest materials. I'm not against you wearing designer wears. But now that you are young, I think you should build your life first. The trouble of Solomon was that before he asked God for wisdom, he already accepted the daughter of Pharaoh as wife. The Bible said, before he builds the Lord, before he builds his house, before he builds the temple, before he builds the wall of Jerusalem. As if God was saying, he will have built those three first before he entered into marriage. Now, unfortunately for him, by the time he realized that he needed wisdom, he was already married. So he had wisdom to manage the people. He had wisdom for business. He had wisdom for administration. He lacked wisdom for marriage. And that made him a wreck eventually. So, why would you put the cart before the horse? You will dress well. People will give you clothes. In fact, they will, co they, will, they will count it a real privilege to accept their gifts when God takes you to where he's taking you. I am telling you. If you wear what they give you, they will go for thanksgiving. And say, God, thank you that I gave this person this clothes and he, he could wear it. Ah, I am highly blessed. People will say that. When you become what God wants to become, will you be, may you become it in the name of Jesus. 
it's a pity I don't have that luxury of time here today. But I will add just one or two more. I realized that the fact that Daniel did not take everything that came to him made him a very disciplined student. So, before he finished his 100 level, the king had a dream. All his professors were invited to interpret the dream of the king. They didn't invite Daniel and his colleagues because they were still students. If they were in 300 level or 400, maybe they would have thought about them. But these are just uh, jam bites. Nobody thought about them. And when all the professors, all the doctors, when they came and they said, look, I had a dream. They said, all right, we are here for you, sir. Tell us your dream, and we'll tell you the interpretation. The I said, no, 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 no. This one, I have... I have been noticing that you people have been deceiving me. Many of the interpretations you gave to me were not accurate. So this one, the only way for me to know that your interpretation will be accurate is to tell me the dream. They said, O oh king, nobody has ever required that from the hands of any wise man or any of the astrologers in Babylon. They changed dialects. They spoke to him in the local dialect. Nebuchadnezzar said, you want to buy time. I am paying you for this matter. And if you are not paying me, then you will not leave. The king has spoken. I was wondering what was going to happen. They were just preparing where to slaughter them. When Daniel heard about it, and you know, rumor we just travel among students. And then he came to Daniel's room. He said, Have you noticed that the king had decreed that Professor So and so will be killed? He said, Which prof? What did he do? Did he commit any crime? He said, No. The king had a dream. And the king refused to tell them the dream. And said, They should tell the dream and tell the interpretation. And he said, No one has ever done that. In fact, among the gods, such God must not fraternize with flesh. For that God to interpret it. Daniel said, is that all? He said, yes. He said, all right. And then he called for fellowship. You know, um, Israelite fellowship students. ICS. Or IFS, have you? IFS. And only four of them. And during the fellowship, Daniel was the one who preached and said, Brethren, we have a matter here. Even though we are four in this university, we know God is here. We want to demand mercies from the Lord. There is a matter. And then he relayed the matter. So let's pray. And these children, they went a praying. And God was just gracious. It was Daniel that God revealed the matter to. And Daniel came to Harioc. Go and tell the king. Did you tell me that they said there was no man that can do it? Go and tell him that you have found a man that could do it. Who is not a God, actually. Who is a mortal man. A man with a difference. Now, I wonder... How did Daniel come to that point? Is my number number four issue is the confidence he had in God. I was praying a few days ago, and my first prayer was, God, will you please convince me more that you are? For no man cometh to God except that he believe that God is. I think we only say it, we have never believed that there is God. Our actions point to the fact that we don't believe that God is. We don't believe that he is real. 
Daniel believed God is real. He believed that God answers prayers. And so, he went not seeking for any book to look for tricks. No, he was just demanding for mercy. And as he prayed, God that is real came to him and showed it. And it was amazing. Amazing that when Daniel interpreted the dream, the king fell flat before Daniel and worshipped Daniel. No king does that anywhere. He must be a human being with a difference. And look at him, 100 level student for that matter. What shocked me about Daniel, and I want to put it to you, all of you, was that the king did two things for Daniel that day. And the way Daniel responded to it shocked me. First, the king made Daniel, gave Daniel promotion to be, to be governor. Daniel said, I will have taken that, sir. Except that I was not the one that prayed. Give it to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He went with nothing. He recognized people that labored with him. He did not take the glory to himself. Now, I know that the sense we have in this country is winners takes all. But if you must be a youth with a difference, you must learn. I read the story of brothers of Joseph when they traveled to Egypt to come and buy grain. And they bought grain. And Joseph commanded his servant to return their money into their sacks and to sow it, to stitch it. And they were going back home. Only one of them remembered that the ass that was carrying this everything is entitled first to take out of the content of the bag. He opened his sack and he found money in his own sack. Others closed their sacks. They felt those animals should eat dry grass. It was only one of them who felt that the animal that I rode to Egypt, that I'm taking back, carrying this heavy load, deserves nice treatment. Only him found money in the mouth of his sack. Only him became richer than all of his brothers. But unfortunately, they were, were as rich as he was, but they never discovered it. Sir, can I tell you that no man can ever become anything all by himself? Don't you think there are people around you that you must appreciate? Don't you think you should give credit to those that desire to receive such credit? Should you take it all to yourself? No, even if you get it once, you may not get it the next time. <laughs> Am I communicating? I'll be rounding off now so that I can move to the next place. Now, the second thing that challenged me about Daniel was that the king made him head of all the wise men in Babylon. All the wise, all the astrologers. That included his professors. So I thought that Daniel will graduate immediately. Since he was the leader of the vice chancellor, since the VC reports to him now, but I was shocked that Daniel went back to school. He sat under those professors. He sat for the same exam other people, other students sat for. Even though he was the head of all, I checked that line. I felt there is no way a man will live like that and he will not stand out. Stand to your feet. I know I will come back. Don't ask me now. Ask Dr. Luwa Shola. He will tell you. He will tell you. I want you to know that it is not amount of things you gather now that makes you great tomorrow. In fact, the more you give out, the more blessed you are. Am I making sense at all? I want you to know that God is interested in, in making you great. 
Otherwise, this meeting and this topic would not have come in the first place. But the fact that God has brought it tells me that he wants to give you road map and road signs that will lead you to where he is taking you. You will be where God is taking you in the name of Jesus. But the first foundation is, are you standing upon the rock? Are you? Have you been delivered from your sins? It's my first issue. And I, as you close your eyes, think very deeply now. How could you be struggling with sin? And you are sinking deeper into it every day. And yet seeking to be great tomorrow. No, we have to deal with that. Because sin will undermine you. Sin will affect the root of your life. And once the roots are affected, then that tree has become an accident waiting for time to happen. Where you are, is there a nudging in your spirit to repent of your sin? And call for help from Jesus. The only one with capacity to save from sin. The only one with capacity to give new life. If you are coming to that position. Can I just invite you to come to the altar here. You notice that look. You've been struggling with sin. And today you want to say no more. I needed to give myself a fresh beginning. With Jesus. Wherever you are. Can you step out? I just want to pray with you just in 30 seconds. And I will just release you into the hands of the leaders of this church. Anybody like that. Pass me not, O oh gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. Just the keyboard alone and very solemnly please. While on others thou art come, only Jesus do not pass me by. Oh, my Savior! Oh, my Savior! My Savior! Is there anybody who is coming? If you must come, can you come now? We'll pray together. You can be free from that sin. God will forgive you one and he will deliver you from the power of that sin. If you will come now. Right. Can I now ask you to pray this and I will just drop the microphone. Can you just ask the Lord that every ambiguity around your Christianity may give way now that you may be a Christian with certainty everywhere you are. A Christian without compromise. Not compromising in your fashion. Not compromising in your conduct. Not compromising in the way of your life. I see a brother here and I want to pray with him. Who has come? And this is very beautiful. Who has come to say, Lord, I want to be free from sin. Brother, can you just confess those sins unto the Lord? You and I are here together in God's presence to pray. And I know the Lord is going to save you and keep you to the very end. Lord, please.
can you also bring your prayer point to close as I pray now? In Jesus' name we have prayed. Holy Father, I just ask you that you will please help us at this point. That every uncertainty about our Christianity, every ambiguity about who we are, you will deal with. You will make us to stand out without compromise in our offices, on campus, on, uh, in the neighborhood. We will not compromise when we want to sew our dresses. We will not compromise when we want to plan our birthday parties. We will not compromise Christian standard during our weddings in the name of Jesus. Holy Father, register your person in us. Do not allow us to live in doubt anymore. Amen. Be real to us in all ramifications in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Now, if there be anyone who is sick here this morning, I speak healing into such bodies in the name of Jesus. If there is anyone who is confused, I ask that light will break forth in your spirit now in the name of Jesus. If there be anyone who is under any bondage, I break the chains and the fetters now in the name of Jesus. I declare your liberty in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father.